Um, good afternoon. I'm Steve Morrison from CSIS, and welcome uh, to this uh, very nice event here this afternoon. Uh, happy holiday to everyone, and I'm sure you're happy to be back at work. Um, we're, uh, uh, we're thrilled today and honored to be able to host uh, Dr. Ariel Pablos Mendez uh, from USAID, the Assistant Administrator for the Global Health Bureau uh, at the U.S. Agency for International Development. Um, he's come here today uh, uh, several months now into that post. Uh, the President nominated him back in March. He took up his duties in August. And he's been very busy since then. And uh, from the early days when Ariel began, we had hoped we could get him here to CSIS at the right moment to speak to this audience here and beyond to the thinking and the direction that thinking has been moving within USAID on the global health, uh, uh, key of global health um, issues before the Bureau as it, as it uh, refines and strengthens its own capacities and its own leadership role. Uh, in moving forward U.S. interests um, in global health, and that's what Ariel's agreed to do here today. And, um, and we're really honored and thrilled uh, that, that you've done that, um, Ariel, and thank you so much. And we're very pleased uh, at, at the staff support that we've received from AID uh, in pulling this event together. Ariel comes uh, from a very distinguished career of almost 13 years at the Rockefeller Foundation, uh, where he really became the dominant personality and leader there across a broad range of issues around research, public-private partnerships, partnerships and research in diseases of poverty, uh, very instrumental, very integral in defining the foundation's approaches on AIDS care um, in Africa. And of course, the foundation became uh, uh, a, a global leader in taking on the health workforce issues, the Joint Learning Initiative on Human Resources um, for Health. Uh, he is an internist, a uh, professor, has been a professor for uh, many years at Columbia uh, University, professor of clinical medicine um, and ep epidemiology. Um, and, um, and I think that th there's a point that many people have made upon his arrival at AID, um, it's, it's, it, we, we did, the Obama administration did very well uh, in succeeding and enlisting Ariel to come and take on uh, this job at this particular moment in time, and, um, and, and we're all very fortunate. Uh, and so please join me in welcoming Ariel Pablos Mendez. Thank you, thank you all. And it's great to see so many friends and old colleagues and new colleagues who allow me to be standing here before you. Uh, I, I'm very pleased to be um, here to share my perspectives in global health and in the context of USAID's emerging strategic framework. I want to start by thanking CSIS. And uh, Steve pointed out, we've been trying to find a time to do this, and this is a good time and, uh, a, for hosting this forum. And, and I want to thank you all for joining in as well. Uh, earlier this month, USAID celebrated its 50th anniversary. We were just uh, sharing that it's also CSIS uh, 50th anniversary, so happy birthday, Steve. Uh, <laughs> President Kennedy founded the United States Agency for International Development on the belief that all people deserve a decent way of life and that peace can be fostered through development. Over the past 50 years, the world indeed has experienced a peaceful revolution of hope and human progress. This process has also contributed to our own nation's peace and prosperity. Dozens of new democracies came into existence. The Green Revolution saved billions from hunger. Global poverty rates fell, and global literacy grew by 60%. The rates of child mortality have declined by nearly 70% with more than 50 million lives saved in the last 20 years alone, children who otherwise would have died. And the hopelessness brought on by the AIDS epidemic has greatly diminished, particularly in a continent uh, where there was an implosion of hope. Future generations will look back at this period as a turning point in the history of public health. And one could say 
in the history of civilization. USAID's contribution to this success has enjoyed bipartisan political support, the engagement of multiple US government agencies, and the participation of civil society and the private sector. The American people and their partners can and should feel very proud of the part they played in achieving these extraordinary accomplishments. Nevertheless, preventable disease and premature death continue to plague much of the developing world, particularly affecting poor women and children. Of the 7.5 million children under five years of age that died last year, two thirds of the deaths were easily preventable. One of every three children in the developing world suffers from stunting due to chronic malnutrition, which too often results in needless deaths. For those who do not perish, malnutrition cripples opportunities and condemn young lives to learn and to earn much less than otherwise. Women in developing countries are more than 100 times uh, more likely to die from pregnancy-related complications than women in the developed world and more than 215 million women have an unmet need for voluntary family planning. HIV and AIDS related diseases continue to kill more people in Africa than any other disease, and neglected tropical diseases affect over one billion people worldwide. Our job is far from done, and our bodies are indeed not growing. But for those of you who may doubt that we will see change on a revolutionary scale in our lifetimes, I challenge your wisdom. I believe there are indications that we are closer than ever before to narrowing the gap between our ideals and the reality of our time. Today, I will introduce USAID's strategic framework for global health. The next chapter of USAID's efforts in global health will build on the strong foundation of prior success. The blueprint will ensure we are better able to adapt to changing realities and challenges which are sure to present themselves in the years ahead. Our strategic framework itself is not new. It is driven by the vision of President Obama's Global Health Initiative, the direction articulated by Administrator Shah in his Barnes lectures to the NIH scientific community early this year, and reflects our agency reforms efforts called USAID Forward. The actual document is being circulated among U.S. government agencies at the moment. I hope to share with you some of the highlights and engage your views actively. I will begin my presentation by touching on the U.S. government context in which this strategy has been developed over the last two years. We are guided by a dynamic and complex set of national policies, directives, initiatives, and other factors that influence USAID operations into a cohesive approach that will guide a more strategic global health response. Secondly, I will outline how our strategy fits with the ever-changing global health landscape. The world is changing. We must have an improved understanding of the forces that directly and indirectly influence our ability to fulfill our mission, our shared mission. And thirdly, I will discuss our priorities and the way forward. With a solid foundation of success, we are poised to make significant impacts on maternal health and child survival. We will march with conviction on what has been a long road towards an AIDS-free generation, while maintaining progress against a host of other infectious diseases. To do so, we need to challenge the world and ourselves, and we will need to adjust the way we work. U.S. efforts in global health are heavily influenced by our international commitments and consensus around the Millennium Development Goals, the Paris Declaration, and the ACRA Agenda for Action, and more being discussed today in Busan. The structure of U.S. assistance is also guided by a number of national policies, presidential initiatives, principles, guidelines. In May 2010, President Obama issued a national security strategy that recognized development as a central pillar of our national security capacity. In September of last year, through the first ever Presidential Policy Directive on Global Development, the President outlined high-level principles and called for a new approach to international development. Further, and it's almost his first anniversary, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton issued a quadriennial diplomacy and development review, an unprecedented joint review of the mandates and capabilities of the Department of State and USAID to ensure that these core elements of American civilian power work in tandem. 
USAID's strategic vision is inspired and aligned with the principles and goals of President Obama's Global Health Initiative and the recently released USAID's policy framework 2011-2015, which is making operational USAID forward reforms in our agency. As Administrator Shah has remarked, USAID is aggressively doing its part to usher in a new era. Through procurement reform, talent management, better policy capacity, and a focus on innovation and results, USAID is undergoing an ambitious transformation of the way we do business, something recognized this year by an independent OECD peer review. USAID's strategic vision is guided by the principles and goals outlined in the GHI. Since the launch of the GHI in May 2009, significant progress has been made towards a more comprehensive global health strategy for America. After some initial bumps on the road, GHI is now fostering greater interagency coordination, country ownership, and smart service integration, while aligning previous health initiatives for greater efficiency, namely the President's Malaria Initiative and the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief. Portfolio reviews across each of our global priorities have opened up our thinking to external participation. While 42 GHI country strategies are either completed or in development and integrating USG programs across health for improved collaboration and efficiencies. The GHI principles, which really bring to life the GHI, are now being operationalized and after some consultations will be systematically implemented by US government teams on the ground. On to the changing landscape. Many things are changing in our global health space far beyond the Beltway and our national borders. The rapidly evolving nature of our sector and its context will require a large degree of flexibility, innovation, and even greater collaboration in the global health community in the years ahead. USAID is prepared for those changes and is engaging proactively to meet those challenges. The epidemiologic transition, a byproduct of our success to date in child survival and family planning, is manifesting itself with a pandemic of chronic non-communicable diseases like cancer, diabetes, and cardiopulmonary disease. And concerns over road safety are bound to grow. These trends will require attention and progressive adjustments in our work, even if we cannot launch a whole new platform today. But there are other, more contextual developments, and we, will know, we all know that context is paramount to better health. I would like to take this opportunity to emphasize what I call the economic transition of health. Despite the economic slowdown in OECD countries, developing countries are in the midst of an unprecedented economic expansion, driven by better governance, globalization of trade and technology, and the demographic dividend. The demographic dividend itself is brought about by family planning and child survival success in combination with rising girls' education. For families and nations, fewer children per woman translate to significant savings, while the demographic pyramid gets an expansion of its working age segment, further strengthened by empowered women joining the workforce. This demographic dividend adds one to two percentage points to the GDP growth of a country for a period of 30 years or more. We have seen this scenario unfolding in Latin America, and more recently, Asia. It is just beginning in Africa and <coughs> elsewhere. Today, the world's economy is 500% larger than it was when USAID started. Persistent inequality is notwithstanding. That's more than twice the growth of the population. So GDP per capita in the world has been growing at a precedential rate historically. Countries that were once A recipients are now amongst our major trading partners, as well as participants in a new emerging aidscape. For many countries, from India to Nigeria, to Philippines and Uzbekistan, the $50 per capita cost of a basic healthcare package represents 10% or less of the additional per capita income growth projected between 2009 and 2012. How do these developments affect health in those countries? How should we adjust to these shifting patterns of economic growth? If experience elsewhere holds truth, these countries will invest proceeds from growth disproportionately in health. There's a very tight correlation between total health expenditure 
and GDP of countries. By the end of this decade, domestic health spending may double in many of USAID partner countries. Yet the default of this growth in the health sector tends to be an expansion of unregulated private provision and out-of-pocket payments, which now accounts for 50 to 80% of the total health expenditure in Africa and in Asia, according to the national health accounts. Such default leads to inequitable access and catastrophic expenditures across all health conditions, old and new. As noted in last year's World Health Report, every year 100 million people are pushed back into poverty, defeating development by health bills because they like prepaid risk pool schemes. This cannot be the future of health, especially when growing economies should afford better health for all without families going bankrupt. How do we turn this challenge into an opportunity? At USAID, we are exploring how we can support health financing reform to extend coverage and decrease out-of-pocket expenditure. Is their own money it can be spent better? Where feasible, we will discuss how we can crowd in local investments of governments and even private sector. Unlike others, we are in discussions with BRIC countries and other emerging economic powerhouses as strategic partners and donors. This brings me to my final point. Our five-year success will be measured by our contributions to saving lives among the poor and vulnerable, particularly mothers and children, strengthening health systems and technological innovation, and by inclusive leadership in global health and international development. The global health portfolio at USAID spans many crucial areas for the health of poor people, from family planning to tuberculosis control. A core belief of the Global Health Initiative reflected in the strategic framework is that improving the health of mothers and children and realizing an AIDS-free generation are areas that have a great potential for impact. Earlier this month, Secretary Clinton outlined a vision to accelerate the decline of HIV infections by maximizing preventive interventions like PMTCT, voluntary medical circumcision, and treatment as prevention as supported by new scientific studies. As the number of new HIV infections falls below the number of deaths from HIV, the AIDS epidemic will enter a period of self-reinforcing decline. Since our programs account for most of PEFAR's work in countries, USAID will contribute to this ambitious yet achievable goal, working with the CDC and many other agencies and partners. The current budget environment will require us to do work with even greater efficiency and lower cost while engaging new partnerships and fostering country ownership for sustainability. As I've said before, we cannot solve the challenges of our time unless we solve them together. This challenge for collective action goes beyond combating a single disease. Child survival is a paramount priority for the U.S. government. It is at the heart of USAID's work and cuts across many of our elements, from nutrition to PMTCT, to malaria control and immunization, to the growing challenge around birth itself. For those of you who are mothers and fathers, I know at time you have put yourself in the shoes of the people we work to help. As my President, Vice President Biden put it at our USAID 50th anniversary celebration, imagine what it feels like to be stripped of your dignity because you can look your child in the eye and, and know that you will be able to provide for that child's needs. The world agrees that no child should die when it can be avoided. The very idea of a child dying from an easily preventable cause is today a foreign concept for most American families. I believe it is our duty to bring this reality home to every American, both the great achievements to date and the remaining challenges. It is to such an understanding that we will be able to maintain strong support for the work we all do. GHI's emphasis on collaboration innovation and integration will greatly facilitate our efforts to accelerate the decline of under five mortality. Dreaming of the day when differences between rich and poor countries will disappear, and it's not far. The experiences that we have in Europe 100 years ago have been pretty much replicated in the last 20 years around the world. We are close. And Minister Shah, a champion of this vision, will share more of it at an upcoming CSIS forum in immunizations on December 9th. 
beyond specific diseases or age groups, GHI also challenges the world and ourselves to work in new ways. USAID's mission in global health, aligned with GHI's principles and USAID policy framework, focuses on the following. Providing technical leadership in responding to global health challenges, partnering, partnering strategically with a wide range of actors, accelerating the development and introduction of innovative technologies, scaling up evidence-based and locally adapted health solutions, <coughs> strengthening local health systems, promoting gender equality, and working efficiently, efficiently as effective stewards of public trust. Many of you are familiar with the Preston Curve, those who are in public health, that plots the health outcomes against gross domestic product for all countries over several decades. That graph shows the richer countries do better than poorer ones. But also, the recent decades have delivered better health outcomes for the same level of income. This actually has been attributed to knowledge, science, technology, local capacity. While development moves the curves along the GDP line, our work ratchets those curves up. As others have put it, it's not only about more money for health, but more health for the money. To support our mission, we are harnessing the technical excellence of our staff in implementation science. How do we adapt, scale, and sustain solutions? We're also strengthening our country support monitoring and evaluation, and communications functions. And we are strengthening our work in health systems as well as in technology and innovation. USAID has a long tradition of supporting technology for development, and Administrator Shah has endorsed a new platform for science, technology, and innovation. Efficiency will be more important than ever to continue to deliver on health <laughs> equity. Public-private partnerships supported by USAID are yielding novel vaccines, and shorter treatments for tuberculosis. In the last decade alone, USAID has formed more than 900 alliances for, for greater health impact. And we will continue to test innovative models, such as crowdsourcing and impact investments to better deliver on our mission. We're also leveraging the potential of ICT, information technology, for global health. From 2006 to 2011, the number of mobile phone subscriptions in the developing world soared from 1.6 billion to 4.6 billion. The growth in Africa has been particularly dramatic. What this will mean for global health is only now starting to come into focus. USAID is committed to leveraging the power of the mobile revolution to improve the lives of women and their families. The agency will also harness the economic transition of health referred to earlier. This new paradigm calls for greater capacity for national stewardship of mix public-private health systems, as well as modernizing health financing for greater efficiency and equity. For this purpose, we will strengthen our health systems platforms in the agency. We are fostering greater country support through a dedicated office geared to operationalize the principles of the Global Health Initiative on the ground, including greater integration, country ownership, accountability, and sustainability. Where economic development and our programs are successful, we will also work towards a progressive transition to independence from foreign aid, as we have done recently in several missions to Latin America and Eastern Europe. USAID uh, has left about 30 countries in its history, so we are not meant to be there forever. To conclude, investment in global health are a pillar of American leadership. Advancing our national interests, making other countries more stable, and the U.S. more secure. They are a fundamental expression of our values. We have an impressive brain trust in our global health community. And I am proud of the talent and the dedication of our diverse USAID staff, as are we of the collaboration with countless partners in the US and abroad. We have made incredible progress in international development and global health in recent decades. And a crop of recent demographic health service results give pause for optimism. We can now imagine near zero deaths among children and mothers, as well as an ACE-free generation. The budget environment notwithstanding, the President Policy Directive, the QDDR, and USAID Forward and the Global Health Initiative position us to maintain momentum and move forward with game-changing innovations 
and better health systems as countries ride this economic transition of health. President Kennedy once said, the conquest of poverty is as difficult, if not more difficult, than the conquest of outer space. His vision to reach the moon took a decade to be realized. Beyond the technological feat, that achievement crystallized a sense that humans are all together in this universe. I have to believe that if we can develop technologies capable of sending man into orbit, we can find ways to deliver better health right here on Earth. The fact is, we only have it this small planet, and collectively, we share the responsibility to ensure that every man, woman, and child is provided with an opportunity to live and to succeed. Given the trajectory of recent decades, I'm optimistic we can realize the founding vision of President Kennedy and complete, in our lifetime, a peaceful revolution of human progress and health for all. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Ariel, for that eloquent presentation. Um, <clears throat> we'll turn to our audience in a few minutes and, and request some quick comments and questions um, for Ariel. Um, we also have received a number of questions from folks online, and we're joined by uh, a few hundred people who are able to watch this, and I'll turn to those. Uh, some of those questions, there's quite a bit of commonality across some of the submissions. Let me turn to some of the sort of tougher issues that are out there today for, um, for all agencies that are involved in contributing to development and global health. Obviously, the, the budget uncertainty is, is, is acute. And um, last week, we saw the outcome of the Global Fund Accra board meeting, uh, the admission that um, a $2.2 billion shortfall in pledged pledged contributions, um, fully a third of the funds that had been pledged, um, and an inability really to to make new commitments for the next two years and hopefully re reorder some of those resources to keep sort of the emergency and immediate life-sustaining commitments alive in their core countries. Uh, for us as a country here in terms of our bilateral budgets, clearly we're living still in the midst of considerable uncertainty and angst about what will happen in this period, uh, but it's fair to say that the, uh, the resource base, the foundational resource base is going to at best be flat and more likely than not be, uh, be dropping in this next phase. How badly is, is to be determined. Ariel, in your view, as you look at this uncertainty, uh, and we know that development and global health have, have uh, been the subject of a lot of speech making lately around the value and the achievements and the need to preserve those. Um, but I think also the pressures are going to build inevitably upon all of the agencies like yourselves to pick your spots and to protect, protect your vital interests and pick your spots in this next period, uh, which makes for uncomfortable kind of decision making, but it's one that the Global Fund was forced into doing just most recently in saying, okay, these are the things we can and cannot do. These are the things that are most vital in moving forward. Given the span of things that you talked about just a moment ago in terms of the core agenda of AID, um, how do you begin to prioritize and, and communicate to an American public about what the core vital pieces of those are that um, as we head into uh, the tough headwinds of, 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 of declining budgets, what, what, how do you respond to that challenge, which I think is inevitable and going to be with us for this next period? Thank you, Steve. It is the case that the economy has not been what we would like, like it to be, and, and budgets are being reviewed, and we are working with our colleagues in Congress, with our colleagues in the administration. Uh, I think, in general, this is an area people would like to protect, but also we are sensitive to the fact that cuts are being discussed as we speak. Uh, so how do we go about 
making choices. And I think what I have stated here and has been a study by the, by the U.S. Administration to the Global Health Initiative is we are focusing on saving lives of mothers and children. There are many specific areas that can accomplish that, and we are looking at which combinations can achieve the best value for the money. We are committed to our work on AIDS, and that remains. And uh, there's been a lot of success and a lot of efficiency gains, as you all know, and we want to carry on that while maximizing prevention. We believe key for the future is to ensure prevention is maximized. Treatment as prevention is part of that equation, but PMTCT and, uh, in, and circumcision, among others, are paramount. So those are the areas. But as the GHI itself also guides, it, we need to change the way we work. And for us, that means not only a greater emphasis on technology and innovation, but also uh, a greater emphasis on health system strengthening, and working different with partners in the private sector, but also with the governments that we serve. Those are the areas in which we are putting our emphasis. The, the Global Fund of, is a pivotal uh, entity, and we all share concerns over recent developments at the Global Fund. Uh, the rounds uh, strategy approach to funding is evolving into a more flexible uh, a way to respond to country needs. And so the idea of having a round pre-specified <laughs> may not be anymore. General manager, manager has been uh, added to the equation to make sure that all of the recommendations of the board and recent reviews will be implemented. And we are working, of course, with PEFAR and others to maintain our commitments to the fund. The fund is very important to uh, uh, align our work with and to leverage three to one other governments and other donors into the causes that we espouse. Um, it was about a year ago that the um, Quadrennial Development and Diplomacy Review, the QDDR, was completed and the decision taken to uh, call upon AID to take a larger role as a leader and uh, a, a convening leader but also a technical and managerial leader uh, in respect to global health programs and to prove its value and its, and its ability to, to do more in those areas looking forward. Um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, the, the, where we are in that process? Because there's been a, there, there were some general benchmarks established. There was a, <clears throat> there were groups created to try and refine the indicators, but most importantly was really to sort of to, to begin to substantiate and prove the case that AID was moving forward in this respect and demonstrating its, its, its proven capacity and leadership and taking on more and more responsibility. Can you talk a bit about what has happened and what lies ahead in this? Because I think that's very fundamental to the future. The outcome of that process of deliberation is very fundamental to the future of of the Bureau and of the agency's ability to carry forward on the mothers and children and the AIDS-free generation and the other pieces that you talk about. Thanks, Steve. Well, it is indeed a very important issue. It's almost a year, and USAID has been moving all along, I think, and I want to recognize Amy Batson, who is our senior deputy and who has indeed been driving a lot of the work in, uh, in, in this benchmarking process uh, over the last uh, 12 months or so. And uh, basically, a lot of progress has been made, a lot of well-documented well -documented exercises from the interagency portfolio reviews to the integrated country strategies to better communications. Uh, all of those pieces are actually uh, coming along very well. It is just uh, happens to be the case that Lois Kwam joined as executive director of the GHI only this year, and there were many things to uh, pay attention to. Uh, from rearticulating the strategy, getting us all uh, in aligned in the same direction and so on. And the State Department is only now moving on really validating the process that we have put in place early this year. And there will be, there's a consultant that is working with the State Department, with the Operations Committee. And we expect to have an interim report to the Secretary this January, so that uh, although the timeline that was specified by the QDDR is September of 2012, we hope to have a significant progress reports for the secretary whose decision will be made, uh, will, will be uh, a, to decide when and how the GHI will transition. 
Thank you. Of the, of the questions that came in from our folks online, there were at least four different questions that approached the issue of nutrition, and there was another that, um, another two that raised the question around water, sanitation, and hygiene. And I think what prompted those questions is the realization that, of course, USAID plays a very important role in those other areas. And um, as you lay out your health uh, uh, framework and your strategy, the question that's coming forward is, can you explain how that will involve uh, uh, AID's uh, linkages and contributions in the nutrition, water, and uh, sanitation areas as well? Thanks. As you know, nutrition has always been a very important pillar of the work of USAID, and when it comes to child survival, we know it cuts across almost all of the conditions that end up making kids vulnerable to the diseases that kill them. And uh, uh, for that reason, we are very much uh, devoted to, and there's been a great partnership process in the last year or so on nutrition and scaling up nutrition. And uh, our work on nutrition, which has a lot to do with supplements and micronutrients and so on, uh, is very much aligned with the President's uh, Feed the Future initiative that is also hosted in USAID. So there's a lot more there on the food security, on the production, on the supply side, uh, and, and but working quite closely with us. The intention is to make sure that all kids in the first thousand years of life from up to the second birthday will have appropriate nutrition for the reasons we said before. Some others will actually add that uh, a feeding, uh, providing food security and good nutrition in those first 1,000 days of life will then also help preempt uh, a adult risk of obesity and related conditions. So we believe it's a very important area for our work. Um, water and sanitation hygiene has always been also a key point of action for UCID. Mm -hmm. Unlike nutrition, it builds on the work that is done across the rest of the agency. There's a lot of heavier lifting on the provision of water and sanitation access to communities with our focus being more on hygiene and drinking water. And, uh, and again, those, uh, those are essential for the uh, child survival goals that we have noted earlier. Thank you. I want to invite uh, some comments and questions from the audience. Uh, please, uh, what we'll do is we'll bring some microphones over. We'll start here. What we'll do is take uh, three or four quick comments and questions. Please identify yourself. There are three hands up here. Um, Matt, if you could, and we'll, and if you could identify yourself and, and, and offer a quick comment or question. I apologize that the podium here is, blocks your view a bit. Please. Yes, I'll stand up. Uh, my name is Michelle Forsley. I'm a professor of global health law at Widener School of Law in Wilmington, Delaware, and uh, work in the field of health sector reform, uh, anti-corruption, pharmaceutical supply, medicines access, et cetera. Uh, one of my observations over the last uh, 15 years that I've been in this field, coming from a field of just practicing law to a field of combining my role as a lawyer with that of public health in the global arena, is that lawyers are not active participants in the work that you do. They're certainly in the corporate offices of USAID and the World Bank and in the World Health Organization and in other development organizations, but they don't seem to be in the field. And from my observation and experience, there are many times when the interventions that USAID and others try to implement are limited by the lack of analysis and understanding of the wider legal infrastructure that may have relevance to your desired outcome. I I mentor students and I run an externship program in global health and the law, and I have to ask myself sometimes, where are these young bright minds going to go? Whether they're US students or foreign students, they come from all over the world. And I'd like to invite you, sir, to consider having uh, the presentation we did last week at the World Bank on law, justice, and development, where we demonstrated the variety of ways in which lawyers and law have been highly relevant to the outcomes. And that includes the World Justice Project, the Rule of Law Index, very much connected to economic outcomes. Uh, if rule of law is important to economic outcomes, then therefore it's important to health. And I'd like to hear your thoughts on that and how we might bring in this extra army. 
Thank you. Uh, in the row right behind, Matt, please identify yourself and uh, offer a quick comment. Thank you. Juan Manuel Sotelo, Bajo WHO. Congratulations, Ariel. Excellent presentation. Uh, two, two things I would like from you. You made a comment on partnerships, and we are talking about global health. I would like uh, your comments on how do you see a multilateral approach? Uh, for instance, how is WHO and PAHO in this region of the world participating in the strategy? And my second matter is related to how does Latin America and the Caribbean show in the global map of USAID in your strategy? Bob Hershey, I'm a consultant. Uh, you had mentioned the internet in your work, and I wonder how it might be used to get together the communities you're working with and gather private funding and get transparency on some of these projects. Thank you. Do we have any other folks who'd like to join in? There's a woman right here, uh, Seth, right here. Thank you. Uh, New Lamore with American Thoracic Society. Um, I wonder if you can address um, USAID's goals for tuberculosis control, um, particularly the need to scale up um, addressing multi-drug resistant TB. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, we'll, so why don't we come back to Ariel? We've got these four questions on the table, and those of you who would like to join in for the next round, please do. Um, thank you, Ariel. Thank you uh, to Michelle. Um, as a public health person, I remember uh, beginning to learn from business people and lawyers and economists, we need to engage all of those uh, uh, disciplines and communities in our work. We have done a lot of that over the years, and uh, USAID has been leading in so many ways. Uh, uh, the, our work in the agency beyond our Bureau on Democracy and Governance is paramount, as you all know. And uh, uh, I have also made allusion to the fact that reform will be important and the law is crucial to, to provide clarity and guidance uh, to governments and society. Nigeria, for example, with uh, clear legislation, uh, allow the private sector to emerge with almost 40 HMOs in Nigeria that are providing services and risk pooling and so on. Again, so the legislation will be important in health, in health systems going forward. It's not just the community work, but especially as those countries mature, uh, the way for us to imprint uh, a, a sustainable and equitable future uh, will have to involve uh, legislation. So health system reform is a space where I will see some of that. Um, a, on WHO partnerships and multilaterals, of course, we are committed, as you know, the U.S. government in so many ways to the multilateral space, uh, especially in leveraging many of the strengths that agents, technical agencies like WHO have uh, in providing normative guidance, technical assistance, and so on, and working always in tandem with ourselves. We are we work very closely with WHO, as you know, in terms of making sure we agree and we support the development of guidelines for countries, and then we help align the implementation. Latin America and the Caribbean is indeed a place where, and I come originally from Mexico, where, where the economic transition have been taking place. And so uh, a, whether it's Brazil or Mexico or Argentina or Chile, you have to imagine that uh, the world is changing there, and thus our role in terms of assistance has also evolved. Uh, we still are committed to, of course, the region, and uh, Haiti is one such an example more recently of our commitment to, to the region. Um, the internet, well, we don't need to say much. The internet's out there, everybody's using it. So uh, whether it's for uh, sharing ideas, forming groups, uh, uh, getting resources, it's just the number of possibilities are huge. Uh, uh, E-learning, uh, and increasingly we are also leveraging through cell phones for many other areas, uh, whether it's electronic records, making sure pregnancies are followed closely, uh, or early childhood immunization and so on. So the IT space is just all over us. And in USAID is doing a lot uh, just on mobile health. We have over 70 projects uh, out of a global portfolio in headquarters, plus those that our, our countries are, are engaging. And we are now developing a strategy for health to bring a cohesive intelligence as to what we're doing in a very important new space for health and development. Uh, tuberculosis, as some of you may know, I come from the tuberculosis community. That was my original uh, a work in MDRTB. So I care a lot for this uh, space. I think that we have witnessed a very successful period in the last 20 years globally, 
and MDRTB remains a great concern. And so uh, and we know that in addition to detecting and treating MDRTB, we must ensure good dose programs are in place to prevent, which is a lot cheaper, MDRTB. And so this is a very important area. We work a lot with WHO in, in supporting uh, the dose programs of WHO. In, uh, but it's an area that is vulnerable, no doubt, in terms of uh, our priorities on uh, child survival that we have stated before. Yet, through MDRTB and through the HIV uh, interactions, we are trying to, to remain supportive of our work in tuberculosis. Thank you. We have a hand up right here and two down in front. Yes, please. Hi, Dr. Mendez, thank you for your excellent presentation. Please speak up a bit. Uh, my name is Nana Seng and I am with the UN Foundation. I work a lot on maternal and newborn health. And when I realize, uh, if you look at the UN uh, MDGs 4 and 5, which supposed to focus on child health and maternal health, they bypass what is supposed to be the critical issue or how to achieve this, to address this issue. And what you said with your presentation, what stuck with, stuck with me was that USID works to save children and mother. And so I wonder what kind of program do you have that actually address family planning, planning and reproductive health that to help to achieve this objective? Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Milan Huen. I'm the director of the Air Force International Health Specialist Program. And as you know, when, when we work with partner nation militaries, we've had partnered with USAID in the past uh, in areas like pandemic influenza preparedness and HIV uh, prevention. And you mentioned health system in your presentation. And our experience when working with other nations that in their health system, there's really no um, barriers between the military health system and the civilian health sector. And as we go forth in, in terms of partners, I wonder what you see would be sort of the military medical role uh, in assisting USAID. Hi, my name is, <coughs> my name is Paul Emer. I was a career foreign service officer with AID for many, many years, a uh, health officer. Um, and I'm now working with a, a group based in the UK called HLSP, which has done a lot of work with health systems. I just have a question. I'm very supportive of uh, your comments about kind of going back again toward a focus on maternal and child health. I will point out, though, that in the mid-'80s, AID fo focused on a, a very important child survival program as well, which then kind of dissolved out. Uh, and I'm just wondering now, given the importance of the health system stuff that you've talked about, and moving back toward a focus on child survival and maternal health, how are you going to make this transition between a disease-oriented approach, which has been relatively successful with PEPFAR and PMI, into a more horizontal kind of broader health systems approach focused on child survival and maternal health? Thank you, Paul. Uh, there's a hand right back here. Yes. Just one second, we'll get a microphone over to you, ma'am. Hello, uh, Barbara Seligman with DAI. My question is, in view of your attention on focusing on capturing or harnessing the economic transition for health, does that change the priorities of countries in which the GHI will be working or how it will look at allocation of resources across countries? And secondly, with regard to health system strengthening and some of the things that you suggested you might be doing differently, could you please maybe describe a few of the things you might see doing a little bit differently in that area than has been done before? Thank you. Thank you. Hello, and thank you for those uh, great remarks. My name is Adora Iris Lee, and I am with International Relief and Development, IRD. You spoke a lot, uh, Doctor, about the relationship between poverty and health, and we all know that quite well. And I'm wondering if you could share your vision, uh, since you are still relatively new here in Washington, but your vision of how the Global Health Initiative will incorporate economic strengthening and women's economic empowerment measures 
into your global health programs. Thank you. Thank you, Ariel. Why don't we come back to you now? We've got five different angles. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Onala, yes, uh, MDGs 4 and 5, the role of family planning. Uh, just like nutrition is central to child survival, uh, family planning is also central. About 20% of maternal deaths from unwanted pregnancies could be prevented. So family planning is important for that. It's important also for uh, women's empowerment, which is a core principle of the GHI. And it's also important because it actually helps with uh, the demographic dividend or economic success, although that's not the reason why we actually drive it. it the military has been so important in so many ways. Uh, we work closely with the OE, not only in emergency response, but across uh, the scope of our works. And uh, uh, your relationships with other militaries are also very important. And uh, I can think of Senegal, where, where the military were, were so important in, in helping prevent HIV taking off in that country. So we look forward to continue that relationship. There are so many dimensions to the collaboration. It's hard for me to pin it down. But clearly, uh, a referral systems might be a, an area where uh, a, the availability of, of hospital services where they are not existent in relief and other situations may be an opportunity. Uh, Paul, thanks for your work all along in this space. Yes, in the 1980s, we had an emphasis on the child survival revolution. Uh, uh, many, many of you here were part of that. And the issue was sustainability. And so how do we make sure that this time all of the efforts we are making can achieve that sustainability so that indeed, as waves come and go, uh, we don't have to uh, uh, go back. Uh, my sense is we have reached a new level uh, in, in many countries now around the world, many regions. And, uh, and it is in that transition where we still need to be committed to many of those uh, vertical programs, but also countries are requiring a greater level of integration. And in, um, so we are still uh, built in a way vertically. We are still accountable to the American people through specific areas, and uh, we, we, we will probably not change that immediately. But the Global Health Initiative already has opened the door for us to look more about country ownership, and that usually means, uh, country ownership means they're looking at everything, all of their needs, their own priorities, and so on. Health system strengthening, sustainability, all of this uh, uh, requires attention. And so the question that was asked by uh, Barbara, uh, so what exactly do we do with health system strengthening? There's plenty there from uh, gathering better evidence, because uh, it's been a field that has, has not had the same degree of science than other areas, to communicating better. Uh, the American people need to understand exactly what it does, how expanding coverage in Ghana leads to uh, not only safer pregnancies, but lower infant mortality. And that sort of evidence will become important because it will then uh, a, uh, support the priorities that we have, again, as construed vertically, but by supporting countries in a more integrated fashion. So uh, we will do a lot of technical assistance will be important. The national health accounts, like the demographic health service, have been hugely important flagship programs of USAID that allow us to understand not only ourselves, but the rest of the world and the countries where things are, where things are going. So that type of evidence, data, capacity for stewardship of mix systems, Many governments are still thinking that the private sector is an oddity or it will go away. It's, it's actually two-thirds of, of the sector, and uh, how to engage constructively with the private sector is the very important going forward. Uh, a, and then finally, on poverty and health, uh, well, yes, we have, we have noted that, uh, I mean, global health is one of the largest segments in USAID, but USAID is devoted very much to development as a whole. So there are many other groups in, in USAID working to foster development, and across the agency, across our foreign uh, a, 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 a aid portfolio, women empowerment is crucial, and it's crucial for all sorts of reasons, but the most importantly, because the payoff is huge. Education and empowerment are huge, both in terms of economic development and also in terms of health, the health of families. Thank you. I think we have time for another round. Um, I'm going to ask one question, which, and then we'll turn to some of you here. Um, we've had the chance recently to, to visit um, Ethiopia and South Africa and Zambia. 
And there's a couple of themes that came through that quite powerfully that from that trip, that from those visits, that um, one in particular that I wanted to ask you to comment on, Ariel, and that is that enormous well, enormous upsurge of pressure from the partner governments upon AID, CDC, OGAC uh, leadership to um, uh, reduce the number of implementing partners uh, that are non-governmental implementing partners, reduce them and streamline and consolidate them, and, uh, uh, and move them towards away from direct service delivery and towards technical support to government organizations, and move towards a greater um, direct funding of by USAID and others of, of partner uh, government institutions. And from the standpoint of the government of Ethiopia or the government of South Africa, th these are th this is what they understand as country ownership, uh, is higher efficiencies, um, fewer implementing partners, not saying that implementing partners are, are, are don't remain very valuable, but it seems to be a core tension right now in, in, in a court managerial challenge because you have many, many, many different contracts out there with implementing partners. They can't just be ended overnight. It's a man managerial challenge. It's a political challenge in terms of whether you take a huge risk of, of accountability if you begin direct funding of government agencies. And of course, there's a lot of resistance from implementing partners, some of whom are losers in this process in terms of being basically asked to phase out their work in some of these countries. I was struck by just how much turmoil and how much drama uh, and debate is centering around that very issue and how much it really lies at AID's door as one of its key, its key challenges. If you could talk about that for a bit. Thank you very much. In, in South Africa, the, the, the change is more complex, right, because South, South Africa is sort of in the upper of that economic transition ladder. And so uh, indeed, uh, are, and, and now that the government is so committed to their own HIV AIDS programming, uh, it is allowing to change really where the priorities uh, go. So there is there's a change in South Africa in terms of our commitments as, as well as Botswana and other countries where, where success and country engagement and economic development allow us to do so. But your, your point is, is a bigger point, it's a point about a, the way in which we engage in what we call in USAID procurement. Uh, and procurement reform is indeed one of the key elements of USAID forward. Uh, a, in we, I, I mean, as we look at what the way in which USAID operates, both the global uh, enterprises and the country-based enterprises, often there's a merging of the two through integrated vehicles that allow us to provide standardized services, uh, a scale, uh, a, and, and the discounts that we get because of that, a integration of multiple components. One very specific uh, successful platform is our supply chain management platforms, for example. And so there's an issue. How can we uh, change the way we do our business if we also want to foster country ownership which will then mean that we should be willing to support governments that qualify in terms of transparency and, and capacity and so on, but also local NGOs. And this is not an easy transition uh, and is not an overnight transition, but if the intention is to get more of that capacity locally so that indeed our success uh, stick in the long term, uh, there's a change. The change will not be as dramatic as uh, I mean, the feasibility itself of change is, is not an easy thing, but also the concern that you may be speaking to uh, may not be as big because, uh, I mean, today maybe only 10 or or 15 percent of our our funding ends up being local. Mm -hmm. And so even if we can go to 25 or 30 percent as part of this reform, the majority of our funding will still be in a similar way. But the other the growth of that small part will be quite significant in many of those countries to allow local NGOs and local capacity and better governments uh, in, in, in this space. And so whether it is in the case of South Africa or Latin America, when there is some transition in programs, what you see is indeed our funding moves from the direct service provision and into providing technical assistance, regional coordination, and that's just the reasonable path uh, during transitions. 
Thank you. We have time for just for one more round of questions. We had a gentleman here in the front row. Um, we have uh, two hands here. We'll take as many as we can here, so please be patient. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, nice talk, Ariel. Nice to see you. Um, just to question, uh, Marcos Espinal from Pajo. Um, just to ask you, um, and, and I don't know if you probably will be able to answer this question, but uh, one of the issues we're seeing is, is our challenges of the international community in Haiti. You mentioned Haiti as a priority, and there's two questions at the beginning about water and sanitation. When we see all these problems about cholera, about earthquake, and so on, I mean, uh, and, and, and some NGOs going in to, to vaccinate, you know, with limited uh, <laughs> numbers. Uh, these are good initiatives, but I'm not going to solve the problem. Haiti has probably 50% of the population without lack of access to water. Is there any discussion going on or anything that the Global Health Initiative, Global Health Bureau, or your role is doing with your counterpart in USAID, because it's about development, to improve access to water in Haiti and work with the new government? Thank you. Thank you. Seth, right, there are two women right there. Please. Thank you. Uh, Joan Holloway with IAPAC. Um, and I'm mentioning this because I know this is an area where you've had a lot of experience, Ariel. It's human resources for health. And I am concerned that with the broader rubric of health system strengthening, the area of human resources for health is getting lost. Now, the private sector is taking up a real, I think, leadership in this with the Frontline Health Worker Coalition, the uh, goal of a million new community health workers. But I think the government has to take a bigger role, too. And I would just like to hear where, you know, what your thoughts are on how USAID can really expand and foster this. Uh, yes, Kay Halpern, Government Accountability Office. Um, earlier, you mentioned um, the uh, austere budget environment, and you gave an example as an example. Um, actually, I, I think the moderator did uh, the Global Fund and how they've had to cut back um, on the uh, future grant rounds. Um, and um, you spoke about um, procurement reform, and I'd like to know um, how the Global Health Initiative. Uh, could work with the other large donor out there, the multilateral donor, the Global Fund, um, to leverage uh, resources. Thank you. Thank you. There was a hand in back here a moment ago. Yes, right there. Hi, I'm Grace Chi from Apt Associates. Um, you had mentioned health system strengthening many times, and it is identified as a key part of the Global Health Initiative, but we haven't seen a lot of very specific guidance or vision out of USAID, so I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to that. Okay. McEwen Hardy, Development Finance International. Uh, can you elaborate on USAID's strategy to address uh, non communicable non-communicable diseases around the world? Thank you. Thank you, great questions. Um, Marcus, in, uh, clearly water sanitation is paramount, as is also housing and many other uh, priorities in Haiti. I mean, is, there's been a, an incredible commitment from the U.S. government and the State Department has been coordinating a, a lot of those efforts. It's not as easy, of course, uh, a, being the ground where where the government was weak to begin with and half of it was almost destroyed during the earthquake, as you know very well. But indeed, water sanitation is a priority in, uh, a, and the availability at least uh, to, to ensure that water may be accessible. USAID has been working very much so in the last year in particular to ensure that that, that is the case. On cholera and having many uh, small-scale vaccine and, well, it is an issue. I mean, the vaccine exists, the supply is limited, and uh, if you're going to do it, you have to do it right. Uh, and I know it's an area where PAHO and CDC ourselves are quite involved in. And, uh, but I agree that it's probably better to have water and sanitation uh, uh, for, the long, for the long haul, and that is indeed the priority. Joy was worried about uh, health systems swallowing human resources. Uh, well, 
human human resources are the health system, in uh, from the from uh, line workers to the professional service providers to I would say the policy makers in the health space are, uh, they have been also relatively neglected and they are very important. It was through the HR window that I began to understand health systems and the reason why is that the economics uh, of the HR only makes sense when you understand the larger economies of the health sector. And uh, so what is appropriate in a poor country uh, may not be appropriate as those countries are moving. And while we all like to have uh, a very good professional providing the services in a poor setting is a lot more efficient. And I think the HR community has done a lot with PEFAR and others in the task shifting to make sure you have community-based workers in those poor areas and so on. So it is paramount and the USAID has, as you also know, has been probably been a lead to the capacity project, Capacity Plus, in leading this space over the last uh, almost 10 years. Uh, Kenny, austere budgets, how do we leverage others? Well, that's what we try to do every day. Uh, in, and we believe that uh, the time is right. In OECD countries, you, you know how the situation is in Europe, and uh, although the Brits are quite courageous and coming along, the Global Fund is a platform for leverage, and that's why it's important for us to, to remain, uh, to keep the Global Fund as a viable platform for, for engagement, as well as many others, the private sector, many of you work in private, in private corporations, but more and more importantly will be how do we crowd back in local uh, public and private financing for the needs of people in countries where the economics are not beginning to allow it. Um, uh, Grace, well, you know, uh, Health Systems 2020, and so next year is up for renewal. And so that will be an opportunity for a redesign of our work in health systems and, uh, as, and, and, and there will be guidance uh, for that uh, coming up. Uh, um, NCDs, uh, uh, again, we do not have an office for NCDs. NCDs is important and we're doing a few things. One is we already have a lot of uh, platforms for measurement, demographic health service that are allowing us to understand the prevalence and trends of smoking, of obesity. So it's a very little or no cost. We are trying to get the dimensions. Demographic health services have been so important in building the stories and monitoring uh, the interventions of success. So that's a very important platform for us uh, going forward. Uh, second, we, are, uh, we know that in order to achieve our MDGs, sometimes you have to do things like advising a pregnant woman to quit smoking. And that's another thing that we are doing. Third, integrated community platforms quite often is healthy lifestyles. And USAID has a lot of experience in behavioral uh, uh, modification or in, in, uh, mass communications on the whole for healthy lifestyles, exercise, nutrition, and diet. All of that lends itself already quite, quite well where we are present to make a dent. I mentioned nutrition in the first 1,000 days of life as being probably a way to preempt adult uh, obesity and associated risk factors. And uh, so all of these are the pieces we are doing today. Uh, we invest, I mean, America invests almost all of the NIH budget, I see my NIH colleagues, uh, 30 billion is on almost all in NCDs and the 50 or 60 billion in R&D that U.S. Pharma does is almost all NCDs. And, uh, and quite often uh, food industries and other industries will be on the table for many of these conversations. So uh, NCD is going to be very important in our foreign affairs in the future. And we are preparing for that future, not jumping until we make sure our priorities are addressed in our current government uh, budget environment. Thank you. Let me just close with one last question for you, Ariel, which has to do looking forward to next year. We'll have the uh, the, the International AIDS Conference, the biannual global meeting, will be here in Washington uh, in July, third week of July next year. It'll be the first time in 22 years that this conference has been back on U.S. soil. Uh, the Obama administration lifted the immigrant ban, the migrant and visitor ban, uh, on persons living with HIV and became possible to do this. 20 to 25,000 people will be here for a full week. Can you talk a little bit about how you see the the impact um, and the and the value of all of this uh, for an American public that hasn't witnessed this directly on their soil for over two decades, and it's going to be coming in the middle of some budgetary tough times and a very in heated presidential and congressional set of races. 
So getting the messages right will be very important, and there's been a lot of deliberations about how to get the very best outcomes from this very important historic moment. If you could offer us your closing thoughts on that, please. Thank you. As I noted before, next year in particular, uh, we are uh, coming out with the priorities that I stressed before for the Global Health Initiative, saving mothers, saving children, and AIDS free generation. And each of those three will have opportunities next year. You're asking about the particular one of the AIDS conference, a major, a major opportunity visibility. I have to say that the U.S. Uh, communities in uh, working in HIV all along have been very strong participants in this country and abroad so that uh, um, it, it's not that it hadn't happened because the conference hadn't taken place here. Uh, I mean, I see Shelley and others who have been so involved in, in the work that we have done in AIDS in the last uh, few years. And so I think it's an important opportunity nonetheless uh, because it will bring attention uh, 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 a lot of voices and case stories, all of that will matter. And in the end, the work that we do is the work that the people, the American people, uh, ask us to do. And to the extent they are compelled, whether it's on AIDS or on saving mothers and children's lives, uh, uh, that should help uh, the work that we do. So the AIDS conference, an opportunity. Uh, uh, stay tuned for the others as well. Thank you very much. Um, before we close, just a reminder, December 9th, at the Willard Hotel from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. Uh, we'll be staging a major conference on the strategic power of vaccines. We'll have an all-star cast there. Uh, the administrator of AID, Rod Shaw, will be delivering an address. Uh, Tony Fauci will be delivering an address. And we have uh, three very high-level panels. I won't go into all the details, but please join us either in person or online on that occasion. I want to thank Barbara Bennett and her staff from AID for helping make this event happen. And from our staff, um, many people worked very hard to pull this together. Uh, Suzanne Brundage, uh, Julia Nagel, Matt Fisher, Carolyn Schrott. Uh, great thanks to all of you. Ariel, you, it's been great to have you here. I hope we'll have you back soon. And I wish you the best of fortune in moving this very ambitious agenda forward. Please join me in thanking Ariel. <laughs>